What's good? Thank you so much for tuning in to this bonus little update episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. And September is a month that has five Mondays in it. And by standard practice here at The Newest Olympian, I take the fifth or at least one of the Mondays in a five Monday month off. And I'm taking a break here just because been a little bit and got a lot going on. But I'm still giving you just a tiny little update here. Going to talk about what we're doing for the charity stuff because I donate every time we take a week off. And then also also uh, going to be giving you a little update about what's been going on Patreon wise and also a sneak preview of something that was on the Patreon if you want to get a sense of some of the things that we post on the TNO Patreon over at the newsolympian.com slash Patreon. But let's start with that charity update. So the last time we gave to a charity was on July 15th. And now I'm recording this on September 30th. So I looked at the number of downloads between July 15th and today, and it was 616,000 downloads, which means that we're going to give $616 to charity. Now, as I'm recording this on September 30th, there's two big things that are happening right now that I would love to try and support. One, here in America, we've got all of the devastation that is happening from Hurricane Helene and just all sorts of flooding is going on and it's pretty devastating for a lot of places and it's really heartbreaking to see. I even know some of my friends personally who have been displaced and it really stinks, especially because not everyone can evacuate. So the first charity that we're going to do, I'm going to basically split the money. So instead of 616 to one charity, I'm going to give 308 to two charities. So first I'm going to give $308 to World Central Kitchen. They might sound familiar because that is the charity that we donated to the first time we did a donation here when we were supporting the efforts that they were doing to give food to people in need in Gaza. Now they are also doing stuff in the U.S. for the flooding, and they are also giving in an area that is going to inspire the next donation of $380, which is going to go to ANERA. So ANERA is an international organization that is providing humanitarian relief in Lebanon. You may have seen that the IDF did some strikes in Beirut, and unfortunately, a lot of civilians were hurt and killed. So ANERA is one of the many charities that is trying to help people. So they're delivering hygiene and medical supplies, mattresses, blankets, stuff for the winter, and food for displaced families in need. So if if you want to learn more about World Central Kitchen, you can go to WCK.org. And if you want to learn about Anera, you can go to Anera.org, A-N-E-R-A.org. Now, also, while we're here, let's talk a little bit about the TNO Patreon. I know I mentioned it briefly in the middle of every episode, but I don't always go into full detail about what exactly is going on over there. So I looked at everything that I posted to the TNO Patreon over the month of September, and I'm going to give a little September TNO Patreon roundup here. So first up, obviously, we posted four ad-free episodes. That is just standard procedure here. If you support any of the TNO tiers, you get access to ad-free episodes. And if I finish them early, you get early access to them. Also did our monthly Q&A live stream. And also I did a poll for some upcoming merch that I was considering doing, as well as a general question about some merch that I was considering making. There was also the bonus video of the Atlanta show, which was posted weeks early. That's actually going to be the next episode, our first in October. So still, if you want to hear what is going to come in that episode early, you can join any tier of the TNO Patreon. I posted three director's commentaries, and director's commentaries usually involve me giving a behind-the-scenes peek about whatever went into that episode, so I did a more lengthy description of what happened with the messed-up audio at the Tennessee live show, or I'll give behind-the-scenes peeks about what's going on with touring or things to come in the show, such as upcoming guests or status on merch things or just any sort of development that's happening with the show. Things like when I have plans about what's going to be the episodes when I'm in between books and stuff like that. Uh, so sometimes it can be specifically about that episode and then other times it can just be generally about the podcast. And I try to upload those usually every other week and I posted three in the month of September. Also, there was the discount code for patrons for the stream that we did of the New York City show on September 23rd. And if you are listening to this on the day that the episode came out on September 30th, today is the last day where you can watch the replay of the stream. You can still go to the newslumpian.com slash live and get a stream ticket. And I'm going to have that stream link live until midnight Eastern, basically 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Then you can still watch the stream. Or if you've already had the ticket and you already got the link, you can rewatch it again. 
again. Up until then, that is when the link will be good until. And then also, we posted a bonus episode, and that is what you're going to hear for the rest of this little update episode. So bonus episodes on the Patreon can range from me taking the Sporkle quizzes at the end of books to see if I can remember every single character that was mentioned in each book, and it gets really hard when it's like, oh, right, they mentioned Elvis one time in the third book of the PJO series, stuff like that. I also once did a video bonus episode where I read a bedtime story of Greek mythology that a listener had mailed to me for the little one. Bonus episodes also sometimes are what we're doing this time around, which is live show audio that I don't know when I'm going to upload it to the actual feed. So I put it up on the Patreon so that you can hear it and get access to that audio because I'm not exactly sure when it will fit in for these things that aren't like standard episodes. So this audio is going to be just a a clip the first 20 minutes or so from the live show that we did in Tampa, Florida earlier this year. And Johnny and I were doing brackets in Florida. All of these shows were half the New Zealand being half Potterless, so we were not doing full-fledged book episodes of TNO, but instead we were doing these brackets to try and answer these big, burning Percy Jackson questions, especially because I just finished reading the five books. It was fun to kind of do some retrospective sorts of things. So what you'll be hearing here at the Tampa Show is we were determining who was the most interesting god or goddess that showed up in the PJO series. So talking about Dionysus versus Zeus versus Artemis, etc., etc., and the way in which John Johnny and I do these brackets is first we just kind of have standard discussions in the first round, but then we add all these rules in the future rounds to make it more challenging for us, such as you can only make your argument for who you think should win using 10 words or less, or you have to argue in rhyming couplet form, or you have to give a whole monologue like you're giving a big presentation at a fancy conference. So that is what this bonus episode is. That's up for Super God Tier and Above Patrons over at the TNO Patreon. And what is going to be the little clip here is just the first round. So you'll get to hear us talk about every god. And then if you want to hear the rest of it, go join the Patreon and get at that super god tier or above. And you can hear this bonus episode. Final note of what's going on the Patreon. There is a new thing that I am putting up there for uh, Patreon. You can just buy individual items as opposed to having a recurring monthly sort of thing. So if you don't want to necessarily make a commitment to a recurring monthly charge, that is okay because I'm going to also be putting up some things just for download. And one of the things that is now available up for download is another one of these brackets. So you may recall that when we were in Gainesville, Florida, we did a live show and we also streamed it where Johnny and I were doing another one of these brackets, but we were determining who was the most interesting demigod that wasn't Percy. I don't remember if we also did or not Annabeth, but we at least ruled out Percy Jackson because it would be too easy. But we did a whole bracket of who was the most interesting character. And you can watch that stream. It's just 10 bucks, and then if you are a patron, you get 20% off, which is pretty cool. And then if you're an Ultra God tier patron, you just get it for free. If you're supporting me at that level, I want you to be able just to watch this replay for free. So that is just my thank you to you for joining at the highest tier. But yeah, 10 bucks for the public. You don't have to be a member of the Patreon. Eight bucks if you are a member of any tier of the Patreon. But if you're an Ultra God, you can get it for free. So that's up there. It's also a half Potterless show, so you also can see Johnny and I do the second act where we do Wizard on Love is Blind, so we take the format of that Netflix show, Love is Blind, and run some Harry Potter characters through it. That was also super fun. And then, of course, like every live show, it ends in a silly and goofy Q&A. So that stream is also up at thenewslympian.com slash Patreon. But without further ado, let's end this little bonus episode with that 20 minute or so clip of Johnny and I in Tampa. For context, I did clean up the audio, like running it through my sound cleanup software. I didn't do any editing though. So it is just exactly what it would have sounded like if you were in the crowd, just a little bit better for your ears listening at home. But this isn't going to be the pristinely edited audio that you are used to hearing because for bonus episodes, that's not always available to me just because I'm so busy doing the podcast and the other stuff. But you'll be able to hear that. And then at some point in the future, I just don't know when this whole thing will probably find its way to the feed and it will be perfectly edited and everything. But if you can't wait for whenever the heck that is, head on over to the newslympian.com slash Patreon and you can hear the rest of this. But for now, here's the first round of Johnny and I in Tampa, Florida, debating who is the most interesting god or goddess that showed up in the Percy Jackson books, the first five books. Woo! 
Tampa, Florida. What is good? Make some noise. Let me hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Whew. It is a delight to be here in a state where I feel like my clothes make sense. I don't ever want to be one of those people that wear sunglasses indoors, but I had this pair and I was like, well, I at least should wear it during the introduction. But I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to perform a fun show tonight here in this wonderful city. And we've got a fun double bill going on. First and foremost, we have a very important question that we need to answer in the Percy Jackson universe. And to help me determine the answer to this very important question, we have a guest who's gonna help me out. So please make some noise for tonight's guest, the best man in my wedding, Johnny Frolicstein. <laughs> Hello, hello. How's it going, bud? Uh, it's going really well. I was looming up there in that little like balcony for a little while before the show. Now they know where the green room is, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. They're going to ambush us. Yeah, that, yeah was, they look like that kind of type. Um, All those rabid Johnny heads are yeah, going to... Yeah, yeah I, I understand. Um, but <laughs> um, there's somebody wearing a Hades the Video Game jean jacket, I think. Fun. Which was really sick, yeah. Rad. And there's somebody who's dressed like Clarice playing Capture the Flag, which Ooh. was also pretty sick. Um, so yeah, I had a nice time creeping on you all before this show. <laughs> <laughs> Have you enjoyed your time here in Tampa thus far? Apparently more than they do. They didn't cheer very much when you said Tampa, what is <laughs> they good? They like, we're all from, is everyone from not Tampa? Oh, who, okay, who here is not from Tampa but drove to the show? Oh, that makes sense of what? why no one cheered. I said Tampa and they said, we're not from here. We're from St. Petersburg, from actually. <laughs> <laughs> really? I thought it was doing it, wow, that's hilarious. Tampa's too expensive. Okay, well, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not going to dunk on Tampa, but I'm happy you're here. So we'll move on to what we are doing tonight for this first act for the New Olympian. What Johnny and I have done is we have set up a bracket, and this bracket will help us determine the best god slash goddess in the first five books of the Percy Jackson series. So obviously I've only read the first five at this point. I know there are many books to come. We will not be judging our decisions based off of that. It's just books one through five of PJO. Johnny's going to siphon off and severance his brain into Heroes of Olympus and onward and get it out of there so it doesn't spoil me, right? Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And the trap door won't open, so I won't fall through. Also true. Um, what do you mean best for best what we do here i think best more accurately translates into most interesting because we don't want to just be like oh well you know zeus stinks and we don't like him like well is he interesting same thing we want to be like oh well, hades is kind of evil like we want to just do it where if someone even if they are more villainous if they are an interesting villain we want to give them their due there so i think when we're saying best we're saying most interesting what we're going to do when we go through the brackets is Johnny and I will usually be talking about each side of the matchup, and we will turn it over to you here in the crowd for the applauseometer or the applauseometer, and you will be clapping to determine who you think should move on to the next round. In the first round, we'll just kind of go through the matchups and just kind of spitball back and forth our thoughts, and then in each round afterwards, there will be new stipulations to make things more fun and interesting. And so, really hard for me, who's never done <laughs> improv before. Yeah, I'm basically <laughs> forcing a non-improv person to do improv with me <laughs> for an hour because I like doing it and I don't get to do it as much anymore. So we'll be doing that, but we will turn to you every single time in those rounds for the applause meter. In the first round, we'll just turn to you if it's like close and we don't have a consensus selection. So get ready, you'll be helping us out. But we will go through each of these brackets, and then ultimately we'll see who the best god or goddess in the series is. Let's do it. Let's do it. So we've done this where we seeded them like a normal March Madness style bracket where people that we think are more likely to win are the higher seeds and then other ones are lower. But as far as the groups of four, those were all mostly randomly assigned. And we know you already know this because you're a big sports crowd. Big so. sports crowd here, yeah. I was going to shout out the Tampa Bay teams, but it seems like no one's from Tampa. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if I, if I said anything that people would care. <laughs> but yeah, we'll go through and we'll see how we get. So let's get into the bracket here. The first randomly assigned group of four. The first matchup is between the number one seeded Hermes and the number four seeded Persephone. Again, this is just based on what they do in the books, not like the whole mythological history of these gods. 
As far as we got in the books, though, for Hermes, we have his helping of Percy in book two. Turns out he has ulterior motives trying to help out his kid. You know, very, look at my son. And then also he goes <laughs> on to be, I guess, like a thorn in Percy's side a little bit as book five goes on, being sort of angry, but then he's also the vessel for us learning about Luke's backstory. We learn a little bit more. We see that Hermes had it kind of tough. I think the Hermes angle here is very interesting because I think the whole premise that the gods not being as involved as they should be in their children's lives is really born out of this idea that Luke became villainous because Hermes wasn't involved in his life. And I think the show picked up on that, right? Like the whole first mm -hmm. season, like pulled that theme up from book five and was like, actually, we're going to make the whole five seasons about this. Mm -hmm. Five seasons, please. Season two. It's season happening. two is happening. That's super cool. Very cool. Absolutely elated about that. But yeah, I think Hermes does allow for very does allow for many interesting things to happen throughout the series. He is kind of like the vessel of that plot line. Persephone, I think she still is interesting. I don't know that she's as interesting, though. Like She has a good run in the Demigod Files, especially where she kind of goes behind Hades' back to facilitate a whole plan. And she is like level-headed and recognizes that Hades is a bit unfair in his treatment of Percy. So I feel like she is interesting, but I think it's just a tough task to go against Hermes specifically in the series. So I feel like Hermes would win this. I don't know, though. Pomegranate is a pretty interesting flavor. Pomegranate are very pomegranate. good. They're really good, but I do yeah, feel Hermes wins. like Hermes, Hermes wins. wins this one. All right, let's <laughs> no go. Brainer. The next matchup in this group of four is between the number two seed, Dionysus, a.k.a. Mr. D, and the three seed, Apollo. Again, interesting. And I know there's a whole Trials of Apollo, but I don't know anything about him, so zoop, we're not talking about that. I don't either, because I entered this building and my brain did the severance thing. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Yeah, the staircase there <laughs> up yeah, to the green yeah, room, actually, yeah. you know, the perspective of the camera changed. And it goes, whoosh. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Dionysus, Mr. D, I mean, he is so captivating in the whole series, just how grumpy he is towards Percy, but then that soft spot that he has for his kids and the whole reason that he is working at Camp Half-Blood anyway, the fact that he's very good at Pac-Man, his dedication to Diet Coke as his I can't drink wine drink of choice, so many wonderful things for Dionysus. Apollo, a bit more one note, at least in these five books. One note, music, nice. <laughs> but still very fun. I think he is very helpful for them in the third book as they make their way across like the train that has all the cars on it and stuff. He's there again in book five when we get the whole Rachel Elizabeth Dare prophecy situation. So he also has his poetry thing and then his weird like hitting on girls thing. So maybe those two balance each other out. Uh, but I, I would feel like Dionysus would be more uh, yeah, interesting. I, I'm definitely on Team Dionysus here, and cool. I think the like, I think the whole time you sort of see him as this comedic relief character, and what really puts it over the edge for me is the scene when they're in the bar and he's playing Pac-Man, and he's like, also like, would you mind looking after my children? And you're like, oh yeah, he's also like a dad and cares about these kids. Like, yeah. yeah, I like that he has two full books where he's really grumpy towards Percy and then in the Titan's Curse, like they have that moment at the top of the Chrysler building when like Mr. D knew his whole plan with Blackjack and everything. Yeah, It's yeah, really yeah. interesting. And then you bring in when he actually like starts helping and does the madness thing with Bessie and all of that later mm -hmm. in book three. Super cool. I also love that Mr. D is just that character from the 1980s comedy movie Airplane who's like, looks like I packed a, picked a bad week to quit smoking. <laughs> That's just Mr. D. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's move on to the next group of four that we have. The number one seed, Poseidon, against the number four seed, Iris. She is cool, but does she do anything besides providing an instant messaging service? You ever seen a double rainbow? That's pretty, it's pretty freaking interesting. <laughs> it is pretty cool. But Poseidon, I mean, I don't know that she can really hold a candle to what Poseidon brings to the table in the series. Yeah, because it would snuff out. Because yeah, <laughs> Nice, nice, nice. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a pretty cut and dry case, uh, which I Cut and wet. Cut and nice. There you go. Good. Very good. I do think it's very funny, though, because everyone got all mad at me when I said Hedwig wasn't that big of a deal. And now nobody was going to bat for Iris. And they're the same. They're just an email service. Anyway. <laughs> The number two seed in this group of four is Artemis. The number three seed is Hera. And now we've got a battle there. Artemis, I love Artemis as the mythological figure, but also specifically in the Titan's Curse, I think Artemis rules. I think she's very cool. She literally takes the weight of the world on her shoulder at one point in it. She has cool fighting moves against the general. She is 
going along with hunting the unknown monster. She's trying to find Annabeth. I think she does so many cool things. Calls Percy a man at one point instead of a boy. <laughs> I've never been called a man, only a boy. No, nah, yeah. um, I'm still a boy. I don't know. I think the thing about Hera to me, though, is I find her to be so unpredictable because, like, you never know what her motives are, right? And so she might mm. be helping you or she might be trying to hinder you, but it seems like her motives are always sort of, like, like she's always playing, you know, chess instead of checkers kind of thing. And ultimately it is sort of about the like maintaining the perfect family thing, but you can never quite tell exactly how what she's doing like yields that result. And I yeah, find yeah. that very interesting. So you're going with the more interesting route and like you don't know like what she cooking, what she right, doing. Right, I right, like that. Compelling. Yeah. Okay. All right. I like that. We, well, yeah, let's let's do we disagree. Her. Yeah, let's let's see how people are feeling. So between these two, if you think that Hera should move on in the round of being the more interesting goddess, make some noise. Woo! All right, that person loved your argument. Uh, uh, if you think Artemis should move on, make some noise. All right. Those and, people loved your argument. <laughs> and now cows will be following you all everywhere you go. Ah, don't blame me. Okay, so the next group of four, the number one seed is Hades. The number four seed is Morpheus, not that Morpheus, the one from the books. I feel like I should put on my sunglasses, though, as we talk about Morpheus, <laughs> and I'll break off the sides. Hades versus Morpheus. I feel like Morpheus, as far as villains go, very cool. Putting people to sleep, awesome. Very fun, very powerful stuff that he brings to the table in The Last Olympian. But Hades also has really cool magical abilities. So here's the thing with Morpheus. It's like, cool, yeah. Interesting, no. Ah, like, <laughs> okay. Like, he's just melatonin. <laughs> like, <laughs> but everyone, ooh. He's just melatonin, but it actually works. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shots just fired at melatonin. Yeah, yeah, catching strays. Is anyone here the son of whoever invented melatonin? <laughs> oh, you mean Jim Melatonin? Jim Melatonin, <laughs> the founder of melatonin. Yeah, I mean, Hades, I think he is very compelling. We obviously have his relationship with his children. We have his relationship with their mother, Mrs. Miss Mar Maria D'Angelo? Yeah. Uh, so he's got all of that. He's got the struggle with the Olympians. I think it's just a, a no-brainer that he would move on to the next round. I agree. I all agree. Right. It's actually so hard to see. How do people wear sunglasses indoors when they're on stage and stuff? I don't understand. These have like light blue frames. And even on stage, I'm like, I can't see anything. Celebrities are weird. Okay, let's move on to the next matchup is between the number two seed, Hephaestus, and the number three seed, Hestia. I think this one's really close. Yeah, we had a hard time even really just hard. seeding which one of these would be two and three because they both do interesting things. I feel like they both aren't in the series for a long time, but they are there for an important time. And I think that, I don't know, I think for me it might be Hestia because I think her whole notion that like, she is the thing that keeps them going as like mm -hmm. the goddess of the home and the hearth um, is very, very, it's very nice, first of all. Um, but I think, you know, when all the gods are all off fighting Typhon and she's the one sort of like holding down the fort, so to speak. Um, I don't know. That's very interesting to me. Yeah. I feel like Hestia, it's also interesting that she was there from the beginning. Hephaestus, though, he does come in multiple times to help them. Kind of grumpy the first time, less grumpy the second time. He's there with Percy in the whole... Um, oh, the Cal uh, oh, Gigi uh, Calypso yes, yeah, situation. That's, right. That's so he scene. comes there, but he's still got, you know, the Hephaestus workshop and everything when the labyrinth goes. So I do think they're very interesting. But yeah, Hestia, I think the scene in the fifth book where Hestia is working with them outside of like after they do the Luke flashback right yeah, like yeah, when they're yeah. going to luke's yeah. place and then she talks to nico and percy like that's a really compelling scene hestia with the hearth she also makes backbiter liquefy so that chronos can't use it again so he doesn't have to have the poorly named sword again very cool uh it's tough i, don't know. I think we should go I to the know. voting yeah yeah okay so if you think that hephaestus should move on to the next round make some noise okay okay if you think hestia should move on to the next round make some noise Okay. That's Hestia an upset. That's the an upset. upset. Very fun, very fun. Okay. We have now our final group of four. First one is the number one seed, Zeus, and the number four seed, Pan. An interesting battle. Someone who sucks and someone who is very cool. <laughs> Even though Zeus is the one seed, because I feel like it made the most sense just to kind of put the big three as the three of the four one seeds. I think Pan is so fascinating and very interesting. And maybe it's a little bit benefited by Pan being such just like 
an enigma for so much of the book until we finally get to meet him in book four. But then when we do meet him, he's hanging out with endangered animals <laughs> and species that have disappeared or only been mythological. What is cooler than that? Like, oh, here's my friend, the Tasmanian tiger. And I was like, what? Like, not only does he know they're real, but they're homies. Like, come on. Totally. And, and like... Rick has such good restraint with Pan, like waiting almost four full books to finally have the big yeah. reveal. And like reading that scene the first time I remember in like the seventh grade was like the most chills I'd ever gotten, maybe to this day, reading a book. It's just like such a lovely scene. But I don't know, like I find Zeus to be very compelling as well as someone who's like, I don't know. I almost read him as a little bit insecure oh, in his for own sure scene. Oh, sure he is. For which sure I, and, he is. And the way that he sort of like tries to cover for that as like, you know, someone who's expected to be such a powerful, um, you know, eternal being. I, yeah, I think this is really tough. I would probably lean Zeus here. I don't know. I think I would lean Pan because even though Zeus is so powerful, he's a little one note throughout the series. And this is not to like say something about Rick or Erden's writing. Like Zeus sucks and Rick was like, got it. Uh, so I feel like when we see Zeus in the books, he's just like angry at Percy for no good reason throughout. And then very narcissistic and very like moving the goalposts for himself of like, well, you know, there shouldn't be any of these demigods, but Thali is okay. Uh, and all these sorts of things like, oh, we can vote to get rid of Percy in book three, but uh, no, please, uh, I would like Thali not to be destroyed. No, but then he also <laughs> voted for, no, he voted no on Percy ultimately because uh, because I think the way that Thalia, the, that vote made him feel, yeah, why don't we put this one to the okay. people? We'll put this one to the people. So if you think that Zeus should make it on, to the next round as being more interesting. Make some noise. Ooh. <laughs> if you think Pan should advance, make some noise. <laughs> Let's hope our flight home goes okay. <laughs> the upset. Uh, all right. So the next matchup is between the number two seed, Athena, and the number three seed, Demeter. Another one that I think is interesting, both people that aren't necessarily here a lot in the story, but their presence is certainly felt. But Athena does have a really cool instance in the Hoover Dam, helping him out, very cool. But then she does turn into grumpy, overprotective mother-in-law type figure towards Percy in book five. Demeter. Speaking of grumpy, overprotective mother. <laughs> well, Demeter, though, is more of like comedic mother-in-law that's just like, oh, I yeah, told like you, you Upper should East be side. He's this. not good enough for you. She doesn't deserve this, or he doesn't deserve you. Yeah, like, I feel like I, I just found all the scenes with Demeter to be so funny. Like, that trope was just perfectly executed. I don't know. I think she's, I, I think she's still a little one note, though. And to me, Athena is, like, terrifying. Like, anytime yeah. I read her speak, I'm like, oh, my goodness. She is, like the scariest of all of them, even though she has the least like actual quote unquote powers, right? Yeah, I, I find her very interesting. Yeah, I think so too. I think um, Athena is similar to what you were saying before, the like interesting because of what are they cooking up? Like it is interesting to know, like does Athena actually like Percy? Is this all a front? Does she really think that he's not good for Annabeth? Is she going to melt that away later? So yeah, I think Athena, Athena moving on makes yeah. sense. Okay. All right, so we have finished the first round. So yes, that was that clip. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And a reminder, if you want to hear the rest of it, join the Super God tier or above at the newslympian.com slash Patreon. I am going to go. Thank you so much for listening. And we will be back next week to continue our coverage of The Lost Hero. It's from the live show in Atlanta. And we cover four chapters of The Lost Hero. Big, chunky, super fun episode with a fun crowd and a really fun Q&A as well. You're going to love the episode. I've been doing the production work and it's fantastic. But yes, thank you for listening. Get ready for that next episode. And until then, I'll pursue you later.